Good morning and welcome back to our Saturday morning Bible class here from Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Germantown, Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. We're studying the letter to the Hebrews on Saturday morning and we're going to be picking up with a new lesson and a new chapter looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, and our lesson for today is going to cover the first 10 verses, so Hebrews 9 verses 1 to 10. There is a new lesson that's been posted in our Facebook feed um, called Hebrews Lesson 13. So it's work in your Bibles, we're in Hebrews 9, but this is the 13th lesson in our Hebrews series. Um, so if you'd like to follow along with the study and discussion guide, then I encourage you to pull that up from our Facebook feed. Um, and uh, we're going to be looking at the first half of chapter 9 today, um, which itself can be divided into two halves. Um, verses 1 through 5 and then verses 6 through 10. So it divides up very nicely, very cleanly um, to our Western minds. So um, that's going to be the plan for today. We'll spend just a moment reviewing what has come before this uh, because this is very, the next logical step in an argument. Um, but let's begin our study of the word with prayer. So we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have graciously provided not only for our physical needs, but especially for our greatest spiritual need by becoming our Savior, by living a perfect life under God's law, and by going to the cross to offer yourself in the heavenly tabernacle as a payment for the sins of the whole world. We ask that as we study your word this morning, that you would help us to appreciate anew the greatness of your sacrifice, both in what it cost you and the ramifications of that sacrifice for us and for the world. Open our eyes to see wonderful things that are written in your word. We ask this in all things in your holy name. Amen. Okay, so if you're looking at the sheet, the new sheet for today at the very top, um, this is uh, this lesson that or the section that we're looking at is a part of the second main uh, body, second main part of the body of the letter. Um, and really, in many ways, it is the central or central doctrinal argument of the letter. And that, that, that central argument is that Christ's high priestly ministry is superior to that of ancient Judaism, of Old Testament Judaism. And this one theme of the greater high priesthood of Jesus is examined from four different perspectives. So kind of think of it like holding up a diamond and you look at that one diamond from four different perspectives. Um, and it's, it's all the same diamond, it's all the same doctrine that Jesus' high priesthood is superior to the priesthood of the Old Testament Judaism. But we're going to view that priesthood through several different angles. And again, it divides up very well to our Western minds. Um, this second main part of the letter divides up into four sections and each gets a chapter. So chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10. In chapter 7, we focused on Jesus is superior, Jesus' priesthood is superior to the Old Testament priesthood because he is a priest in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. So he works as a superior priest. His, his actual priesthood is itself superior. And in the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at he, Hebrews chapter 8, where Jesus, where um, where it said that Jesus is the guarantor or the mediator of a better covenant. So last week we talked a, a great deal about the distinction between the quote unquote old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, or the Sinaitic covenant, the covenant that God made with Old Testament Israel at Mount Sinai and through Moses. So Moses was the guarantor or the the mediator of the Mosaic or Sinaitic covenant. So that's the old covenant. Remember, it was a two-sided covenant where God promised to be the God of Israel if they kept his laws and commands. So God had a part to play and Israel had a part to play. And unfortunately, 
Israel was not able to keep their end of the covenant, of the contract. And so eventually God is not their God. God is now the Christian God. Um, Christianity is the fulfillment or the fruit of Old Testament Judaism. And they do not live in the land flowing with milk and honey, even today. Um, while there is the national state of Israel and Palestine, it in, in no way resembles the borders um, of what God had originally uh, prescribed for God's Old Testament people. So, um, so he's is a guarantor or a mediator of a better covenant. So he's a superior, superior in as to his priesthood. He is superior as to the covenant that he enacts. And now in this chapter, we're going to see that Jesus' high priestly work is superior because it takes place in a better tabernacle. It takes place in a superior tabernacle. And of course, so what we're drawing upon now is Old Testament imagery of the tabernacle and the temple. Remember, the tabernacle is that mobile um, worship space uh, with the holy place and the most holy place in the center where God is worshiped. And then when the tabernacle, um, when, well, when David um, establishes Jerusalem as his capital city, um, he plans and then Solomon builds a temple and what was once mobile becomes permanent. So the tabernacle is replaced by the temple, which also has the holy place, the most holy place or the center of the worship of the one true God um, was located. So that, that's the Old Testament imagery that we're going to be using. And there is a direct reference in these verses to that tabernacle or to that, um, to that temple. Though when you, he's going to talk about tabernacle, but uh, just think, remember the temple kind of swallowed up the tabernacle that all the temple did is make what the tabernacle was permanent. It made it, uh, but the tabernacle was mobile. Um, it was meant to move with the people in their 40 years of wandering. What, what was meant to be moved becomes permanent in the temple, one spot, the spot where God put his name. Um, so this lesson that we're going to look at today covers the first half of chapter 9. So we, we're looking at this. Jesus is a superior high priesthood from four different perspectives. We've already looked at he's the superior, he has a superior priesthood, and he is a guarantee or a mediator of a, of a superior covenant. Now we, we're going to look at the fact that he is, um, his priesthood is superior because it takes place in a superior tabernacle. But in this lesson, in lesson 13, we're going to focus especially on the role of the tabernacle or the temple under the old covenant. And it's going to be in the next lesson, lesson 14, that will draw the comparison between the Jesus' action in the heavenly tabernacle and what the Old Testament priests did in the earthly tabernacle. But today, all we're going to focus on is this description is the writer of the Hebrews' description of what takes place in the earthly tabernacle under the Old Testament system. Okay, so that's what, if you divide this chapter, chapter 9, into two halves, the first half describes what happens in the earthly tabernacle. The second half describes what takes place in the heavenly tabernacle, in the comparison between the two. Okay. So with that being said, let's go ahead and, um, and read the first verse. Now, um, at least the new NIV begins with the word now. Um, and this is, this is a logical now. Okay, so if you look back at what has just come before, chapter 8, verse 13, by calling this covenant, the covenant that Jesus enacts, or the, the covenant that Jesus is the mediator of, by calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, the Mosaic Covenant, made that obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Now, logically, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. 
So I just want you to notice how the writer of the Hebrews is pushing off of the end of chapter 8. He says, now that we've talked about Jesus' superior priesthood, and we've talked about the superior covenant, let's talk about the stipulations of that old covenant. And that old covenant had these two things, regulations for worship. So there were certain rules that had to be followed in order to in the worship of the one true God. And there was an earthly sanctuary. So the these worship regulations revolved around a place, um, revolved around first the, the holy place and the most holy place and the tabernacle and then the holy place, the most holy place and the temple. Okay, so that's all that's going on in, in verse, I mean, it's all that's going on. Um, in verse one, he's pushing off of the end of chapter eight and he's introducing the next strand of the argument by bringing up the rules and regulations that take place in the earthly tabernacle. Um, so I just have a comment on num for number one. The chapter begins with a statement introducing the exposition of two closely related topics. So topic number one would be the regulations that govern the Old Testament sacrificial system. And two are the tabernacles in which the most important of these sacrifices were offered. Okay, so those are the two major sections. Now, if, so again, if you you can start to see the the beautiful um, and careful outline or division that that the writer of the Hebrews is doing. This is well thought out. Um, this is the second main part of the letter. That main part of the letter is divided into four parts. We're in part three. That part itself is divided into two parts, one to 10 and 11 to the end. And this one part that we're in is divided into two parts. Um, it's divided into the, the part about the regulations and the part about the, t of the sanctuary. So there's just a very well-organized, very well-thought-out, very beautifully constructed argument that the writer of the Hebrews is making. Uh, my last comment for verse one, after this introductory statement, he's going to treat these two things that he's talked about in reverse orders. There's a little chiasm here. And if you don't know what a chiasm is, then don't worry about it. Um, but there's a little chiasm here. So first he's going to talk about the specifics of the tabernacle of the earthly sanctuary. And then he's going to talk about the regulations that govern the sacrifices that are that are introduced or that take place in that earthly tabernacle. All right, so let's first let's talk about verses two to five. We're going to talk about that earthly tabernacle itself. Okay, we're going to talk about the, the space, the physical space where the worship of the one true God took place under the old covenant. And this is literally going to describe the furniture that was in the place. Okay, so um, this is chapter 9, verses 2 to 5. A tabernacle was set up in its first room. So this is the holy place. In the first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered gold covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of the glory. Again, that's a very Hebrews way of talking about God. They don't he didn't just say the name of God, so you talk about the majesty or the glory or something like that. So above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. Okay, so he's just kind of introducing or touching on these things. For the most part, these verses describe the holy place and the most holy place and the tabernacle which was then copied exactly in the temple. And you'll find God's commands concerning the building of the tabernacle in Exodus 25 through 40, Exodus chapters 25 through 40. Now, one of the things I'll just point out, 
yeah, those are chapters 25 through 40. So there's a tremendous amount of detail that goes into the commands to build the earthly tabernacle. And that is precisely what the writer of the Hebrews is building on. He's building on the fact that all of these regulations that God gave Moses when he built the tabernacle, he gave because the tabernacle was a shadow or a copy of a greater tabernacle that is in heaven. Um, so just maybe kind of tuck that away. All these details about the, the earthly tabernacle are given because the earthly tabernacle, our temple, is a, a poor copy or a physical copy, a physical shadow, foreshadowing of the real tabernacle that is in heaven. Now we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about that in the next lesson. We're going to talk about that heavenly tabernacle. But just for now... Just take note of the fact that there's all these details that are given about the building of the tabernacle, um, 16 chapters worth of, of instructions about that tabernacle, uh, because, the, because it's so important, because it is a copy or a foreshadowing of the heavenly tabernacle. Uh, like, were they in the temple at Jesus' time, or had they been lost by then? So, it's a good question. Rachel's question is, were the, was the Ark of the Covenant present in the temple at the time of Christ? Um, and I would, have to go, I would have to go back and look at that. Um, my, my initial thought is no. No. Um, but, but I don't know off the top of my head. I would have to go back and look. I, I just don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. And I don't want to speculate and give a, give a wrong answer. Um, we do know that Nebuchadnezzar carried away what's called the holy articles of the temple. When, when he sacked the city of Jerusalem and he destroyed the temple, he carried away the, art of the, the holy articles and he put them in his treasury. And then when the Persians allowed God's people to come back, they sent those holy articles back with them. So could the Ark of the Covenant have been one of those holy relics that was take, carried away by Nebuchadnezzar and then given back to the people through the Persians? I think it's possible that that is the case. Okay, um, let's look at verses 6 through 10. Okay, so now the second half, remember the first half talked about the tabernacle itself, the, the physical space. Now we're going to talk about the worship regulations, the, the regulations that governed the, um, the, the worship or the sacrifices that happened in that most holy place. So verse 6, when everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, for the, the time of the writer and his audience, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Okay, so a couple of thoughts here. In Hebrews 9, verses 6 and 7, the writer of the Hebrews is drawing out a, a, an important comparison. So let's reread those verses. When everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered into the outer room to carry on their ministry 
but only the high priest entered the inner room and that only once a year and so on and so on. So what's being, um, being compared is the ministry that takes place in the holy place and the ministry that takes place in the most holy place. Okay, those are the two things that are being compared. Are the, the, the ministry of the average priest, the ho-hum priest, the priest that went into the holy place, and the ministry of the high priest, the high priest who went into the most holy place. Um, so that, those are the two things that are being compared. Now you might um, ask yourself, what kinds of things did the ho-hum priest do? What kinds of things were the what, what kinds of things took place in that outer room, in the holy place? Because we get a big, long description of what happens in the most holy place. Only the high priest, only once a year, only with blood, right? But what took place in that outer room? Um, and you can read about these things in Leviticus and Exodus. Remember, those are the two, the two givings of the law, the... Um, um, there's, there's a lot of repetition. I shouldn't say that. The two givings of the law are Exodus and Deuteronomy. But the book of Leviticus is focused especially on the priest, the Levitical priesthood, so the work of those Levites. So that's why there's a lot of regulations about what happens in the tabernacle in the book of Leviticus. But kind of the three things that, uh, that the priests would have done in that outer room, in the outer court, is they would have burned incense twice a day. Now you'll notice this is the only one of the three references that has a New Testament reference attached to it. And that New Testament reference is Luke 1, verses 8 and 9, which is the story of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. And you'll, what you'll remember is that Zechariah drew, his, his, his name was drawn, his lot was drawn, to where he was the priest who was able to go in and offer the, the, the sacrifice of incense. Um, so you see an example of this in play in the New Testament. And of course, while he's in the holy place, Gabriel appears to him and tells him that he's going to have a son, and he laughs and gets his ability to speak taken away for nine months. Um, so, But that's, um, that's one of the things they did. They burned incense twice a day. They set out what are called the show loaves, um, and the um, these were loaves of bread that were placed on the table of presence, um, so that it was a table that that represented the presence of God. And as the presence of God, you made a sacro a grain sacrifice to God. So these um, show loaves were placed there. Those loaves would have been after they had served their purpose in the tabernacle, would have been consumed by the Levites. Um, and there is a story in David's life where he goes to Shiloh and goes to the tabernacle is there and he and his men eat the consecrated bread that only the priests were supposed to eat. Well, that's the show bread. That's the show loaves. And then lastly, the lamp the lampstand, the seven-fold lampstand in the holy place was supposed to stay lit all the time. So when they went in twice a day, they trimmed the lamp. Um, they made sure there was oil in the lamp and wick in the, in the wick, uh, enough wick in the lamp to make sure that the lampstand stayed burning throughout the day. Um, so even though those things are not discussed in the letter itself, um, you can find those regulate those rules and regulations in the noted um, Old Testament passages that are written there. All right, on the back of our lesson, um, we're going to look at number four. Why was entering the most holy place such a big deal, and how did God emphasize the seriousness of this action? Well, remember, when Moses set up the tabernacle, and it was finally completed. Then the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud moved over the tabernacle, and the most holy place was filled with the presence of God so that no one could enter it. No sinful human being can enter into the presence of God. And that the, the, um, the most holy place is where God dwells. 
He dwells, he's, he's described in the Old Testament as dwelling between the cherubim. Um, he dwells um, between the, the wings, where the wings of the cherubim came down and touched each other, right over the center of the Ark of the Covenant. That's where God dwelt with his people. He dwelt between the cherubim. And so to enter into the most holy place was to enter into the presence of God. And you don't do that lightly. Um, you don't enter into the presence of God lightly, especially if you're a sinful person, because sinful people cannot survive being in the presence of God. Think about Moses, when Moses asks to see God in all of his glory. God says, Moses, you wouldn't be able to survive that. You would be fried to a crisp. And so I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock and I'll put my hand over you and I'll pass by you and you can see my back. You can see a lesser manifestation of my glory. But you can't see me in all my glory as a sinful human being and survive. Or um, in, his, in his call to ministry in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah sees a vision of the temple, the most holy place, and God's presence fills the temple. And, um, and, Moses, uh, and Isaiah says, woe to me. In other words, I might as well be dead um, uh, because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and I have seen the Lord. You can't go into the presence of God as a sinful human being and expect good things to happen. Um, only uh, you, such a person deserves death. Sinful person entering into the presence of God deserves death. And so what God does is he, in order to emphasize the seriousness of sinners entering into his presence, is that he sets up all these laws and rules and regulations surrounding entering into his presence. And so if you're going to enter into God's presence and you're under the Old Testament priesthood, then there are all these things that have to be true. All right, so first of all, you have to be the right person. There's only one person in the entire nation of Israel who can go into the holy place, the most holy place, and that is the high priest. Right? So you got the whole nation. The, the whole nation is represented by the tribe of Levi. But that whole tribe of Levi is represented by one high priest. So in order to enter into the presence of God, you have to be the right person. Only one person, the high priest. And, and not only does it have to be the right person, but it's got to be the right person at the right time. And the right time is only one day a year, the Day of Atonement. There's one person on one day who can enter into the most holy place. And that one person can enter the most holy place on that one day with this one qualification. They have to be carrying the blood of a sacrifice. You cannot enter into the presence of God without some kind of blood covering your sins. Okay? So only the high priest could enter, the, enter into the holy place, only on the high day of atonement, and only carrying the blood the, of the sacrifice for the, his sins and the sins of the people. And this is all supposed to be a reminder of how serious it is to enter into the presence of God, how remarkable it is to enter into the presence of God. Um, now, all these regulations that are being described here in this, these verses um, surround the great day of atonement. If you want to read more about those regulations, then read Leviticus 16. Leviticus chapter 16 are the, <clears throat> the rules and regulations, the the, the laws that surround the high day of atonement in which the one high priest, the one day a year, is able to enter into the most holy place and only with the blood of the sacrifice. Okay, so number five. One 
and I didn't know really how to say this. I know I, 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 I wanted to use the word flaw, but then that makes it sound like there was something wrong with what God ordained. And that it, it still kind of comes across with weakness. But there's something wrong with the Old Testament covenant. There's something, there's something about the Old Testament covenant that doesn't work. And this is the point that has been made at the end of chapter 8. Remember, the end of chapter 8 said that by calling this covenant new, God showed that the covenant that we call old was going to become obsolete. Um, the, the problem, and even that, the word problem kind of um, emphasizes or maybe gives the impression that there's something wrong with what God commanded. And there's nothing wrong with the, with the covenant. There's nothing wrong with the tabernacle. The problem is with us. Because we're sinful people, that covenant and that tabernacle don't work. Right? So, so I settled on the word weakness. One weakness of the earthly tabernacle was that it severely limited direct access to God. Only one man, only once a year, and only under strict conditions. Okay, So according to Hebrews 9, 9, and 10, what is another weakness of that tabernacle? Um, and this is the most important weakness. So, so one weakness is that it limits the number of people that can enter into God's presence. But more importantly, verse 9, this is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered in that earthly tabernacle were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They're only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until a time of the new order. So the other weakness of the earthly tabernacle is that it couldn't actually forgive sins. It didn't actually cleanse the consciences of the worshipers. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about that in the next question. So number six, the purpose of Hebrews is to convince the original audience that it would be foolish, uh, I switch these words, it would be foolish to go back to Judaism when they have something better in Christ. In this section, the writer has shown that the tabernacle and its ceremonies did not actually forgive sins. Only Christ could do that. So uh, you might say, um, how were, this is a question that a lot of people have um, from time to time, and unfortunately, um, many huge swaths of the Christian church don't answer this question well. Um, how were the sins of God's Old Testament people paid for? That's the question that people have. How were the sins of God's Old Testament people paid for? If Jesus paid for the sins of the world, then what about the sins of everybody who lived before Jesus? How were their sins forgiven? I guess first First of all, we could ask the more basic question, were they forgiven? And the answer to that question is yes. When Jesus died to take away the sins of the world, that doesn't just talk about scope, the sins of everybody in the whole world, but also in time. It takes away the sins of everybody in the whole world who has ever lived or will ever live. So when Jesus dies on the cross, he takes away the sins of everyone who has ever lived, is living, or will ever live. And the answer, the correct answer to that question is, in a sense, God's Old Testament people, sins were forgiven on credit. Okay. Now, what you and you and I are familiar with the concept of a credit card. We go into a store, and we want to buy something. We don't have the cash to buy that thing. So we give them our credit card. The credit card company pays for the item in our place, and now we owe the credit card company. The item is actually paid for. 
is at least as far as the store is concerned. The credit card company pays the store for the item. And now we have promised, we've signed when we sign that little slip of paper, we sign um, as a, a promise that we're going to pay back the credit card company um, what, has, what has been paid, what they have laid out. In a very real sense, God's Old Testament people's sins were forgiven on credit. God actually forgave their sins, but not because of the sacrifices that they made. The, the sacrifices that they made, those sacrifices in and of themselves could not forgive sin. Because the only way that human sin can be atoned for is with human death. And the sacrifices were all animal death. The, you know, it was, it was the blood of bulls and goats and birds. Um, and so you can't sacrifice a bull for the sins of a human being. Only the death of a human being the sins of a human being. So then you might say, well, what's the point of the sacrifices? If the sacrifices didn't actually take away sin, then why did God command the sacrifices? Well, the sacri those Old Testament sacrifices are the credit card. They, they point ahead to the great sacrifice that Christ would make. But the point that's right of the Hebrews is making here is that if, it, if the, and he's going to talk about the work of Christ in just a second, the blood of Christ. In fact, if you have the NIV, you'll notice that the heading of the next section is called the blood of Christ. Okay, So the point that he's making is that the blood of the sacrifices of the Old Testament covenant, they in and of themselves were not able to forgive sins, but they foreshadowed or looked ahead to the ultimate payment that Christ would make on the cross. So in a very real way, or a way that makes sense to our, to our minds, God's old, the sins of God's Old Testament people were forgiven on credit. He really did forgive their sins, um, but he forgave their sins in light of the, of the payment that Christ would make on the cross. Um, he gave them their forgiveness before their forgiveness was actually paid for in full. And that's what the writer of the, the writer of the Hebrews is emphasizing. Is that it wasn't the it wasn't the animal sacrifices that forgave sins. Those just pointed ahead to a greater sacrifice, the greater sacrifice of what Jesus did on the cross. Okay? So, number six, part two. I doubt that any of us would ever be tempted to return to Old Testament Judaism even if temple worship were possible, which it isn't. In other words, you know, we can't make sacrifice, animal sacrifices to God anymore because there is no holy place and there is no most holy place. The temple was destroyed in 70 years. You know, there is, no, there is no place where we can go and make animal sacrifices to God. Now, even if there were, I don't think that, that anyone watching this video would be tempted to say, I want to go back to that system. But what ceremonial activities might we be tempted to consider as accomplishing the forgiveness of sins? And these are the kind of things that you would, you know, that you would expect to, to be here. I know this is kind of a ho-hum question, but you know, some of the things that I think people get in they get in the mindset that these are the reasons they're forgiven is because they pray um i'll never forget a time when i knocked on a door of a delinquent member and we were talking the elder and i were talking to this person about how important church attendance was and they said don't worry about me pastor i pray every day as if our praying is what makes us right with God. Okay, if you think that by your prayers you are right with God, you're in a whole mess of trouble. Because it's not our praying that gets us right with God, it's Christ's sacrifice that gets us right with God. So prayer might be one. Worship attendance might be one. So you might say, well, the reason I'm going to get into heaven is because I'm a very faithful attendee at worship whether that's 
live worship or you know virtual worship in our COVID time. Um, you might say, you know, but but I am very faithful in my worship attendance, um, and that's why I'm going to be right with God. Well, that's again making something that we do the basis of our relationship with God instead of what Christ did, what God did in Christ to make us right with Him. Or maybe it's reading our Bible, Bible reading, regular Bible reading, which is good, and that's the way that God speaks to us. But the reason I'm going to be saved is not because I read my Bible, but because of the, the Savior that my Bible reveals to me. Right? That's why I'm going to be saved. Or maybe it's our offerings, whether that's the offering of time. In other words, maybe we say, maybe we start to think that the reason that, that we're good with God is because we, you know, we are participating in Bible studies or because we're in the praise band or because we um, because we were on some board or committee or something like that, you know, that we're giving our time. Or maybe it's treasure, right? Maybe we think because my offering is in the top 10% of the church or 5% of the church or 1% of the church or whatever, we think that we're right with God. Um, the point is, we might never be so foolish as to think that animal sacrifices are what make us right with God. But that doesn't mean that we're not tempted to think that there are things that make us right with God that don't make us right with God. Right? We have our own temptations to focus on our own works um, as, the basis, as our basis for a right relationship with God. And then so, number six, part three why must the temptations to view these actions in this way be so strongly resisted? Well, because if they don't, if we don't resist them, we will very quickly degenerate into a religion of works. We will very quickly degenerate into a, a system where we save ourselves by our good works, by our praying Bible reading, attending church, making offerings, serving in the church, serving others in the church. As soon as we start to think that those things are the things that save us, then we separate ourselves from the only thing that saves us, which is the blood of the Lamb, which is the blood of Jesus, the blood of Christ. So if we don't, so if we don't strongly resist the temptations to make the things that we do the basis of our relationship with God, then before we know it, we will find ourselves back under the yoke of work righteousness, of thinking that we have to earn our spot in heaven, instead of rejoicing in the fact that Jesus gives us that victory. He gives us that, that um, forgiveness uh, by his life and his death and his resurrection. All right, so that's why it's so important. So that's where we'll stop for today. We're going to, um, we'll end with verse 10, and then next week, God willing, when we meet again, we'll pick up at verse 11. And you'll notice that the next section is quite a bit longer um, than this section is. Um, and so uh, we'll, it'll take us a while to get to the second half of chapter 9. This is a little bit of a shorter lesson. Um, but thank you for joining us. Let's close with the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always. Amen. Thank you very much. Hope to see you again next week.